Lovely. So let me now briefly introduce our first speaker, very much one of the, uh, uh, what shall I say, the elder statesman of this whole field of cultural studies, as indeed is Professor Charmian Brinson, I should say stateswoman, uh, who are kicking things off this uh, early afternoon. Um, lovely. So, Anthony Grenville then, uh, he lectured in German at the universities of Reading and Bristol and also Westminster in his earlier career. Uh, since the late 1990s, he's been very intimately involved with the Association of Jewish Refugees and for 12 years was the editor of its uh, rather invaluable and always lively uh, journal. Uh, perhaps most importantly here, he's a founder member, really key member of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies, which as you'll already know, is part of the Institute of Modern Languages Research, University of London. Uh, he's acted as its chair, in fact, since 2013. I could go on, he's published widely. Again, I think many of you will be well aware of his extensive publications, but just to mention one or two, Jewish Refugees from Germany and Austria in Britain, 1933 to 1970, published in 2010, and the nicely titled Encounters with Albion, Britain and the British in texts by Jewish refugees from Nazism in 2018. And as you will already be aware, but let me say it anyway, he's going to be presenting on the following topic, childhood trauma as represented in literary works by Jewish refugee refugees from Nazism in Britain. Over to you, Tony. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, the memoirs and autobiographies of Jewish children who came to Britain as refugees from the Nazis between 1933 and 1939 present ample evidence of traumatic experience. In recent decades, such texts by former refugee children have proliferated to an astonishing extent, now numbering many dozens. For this paper, I've tried to make as neutral a selection as possible by focusing on four texts generally acknowledged to be among the finest literary achievements in this subgenre. Judith Kerr's trilogy, Out of the Hitler Time, Charles Hannam's Heartland trilogy, A Boy in Your Situation, Almost an Englishman and Outsider Inside, Laura Siegel's Other People's Houses, and Eva Feige's Little Eden. <coughs> Refugee children were frequently scarred psychologically by a fear of the Germans that was the product of their own experiences under Nazi rule. It could also be transmitted to them as they sensed the change in their parents that took place as the pressures on Jews mounted after 1933. Even Judith Kerr's Anna, a thinly fictionalized self-portrait, who in these texts is the child least affected by the experience of forced emigration, shows evidence of a traumatic fear of the Nazis. It's with the seemingly invincible advance of the German armies across Western Europe in spring and summer 1940, that Anna's fear of the Nazis emerges as a repeated theme in the narrative. As the Nazi armies come closer to London geographically, the threat that they pose also becomes more disturbing to Anna psychologically. The bombing of Rotterdam in May 1940 causes a Polish lady resident in the Hotel Continental in Bloomsbury, where Anna's family is living, to recall the bombing of Warsaw and the German occupation of the city, triggering a fit of panic in Anna. Quote, I hide in a cellar, the Polish lady remembered, but then come the Nazis to seek for Jews. It was very warm in the lounge and Anna suddenly found it difficult to breathe. I feel a bit sick, she said, and was surprised by the smallness of her voice. Mama at once came over to her and Papa and one of the Poles struggled to open a window. A rush of cool air came in from the yard at the back of the hotel, and after a moment she felt better. There, said Papa, you've got your colour back. After Dunkirk, the threat of a German invasion of Britain takes on a new immediacy for Anna. When she sees an assortment of metal objects dumped in the open spaces of Russell Square to prevent Nazi paratroopers from landing, 
her fear of German parachutists assumes nightmare proportions. The vision of Jews being hunted down by the Nazis haunts her imagination. It finds its culminating expression in a terrifying recurrent dream. Quote, Anna tried, as always, not to think about the parachutists, but sometimes in bed at night, her guard slipped, and then she saw them dropping down silently among the trees of Russell Square. They were never in disguise, but in full uniform, covered with black leather and swastikas, which were clearly visible, even though it was dark. They called whispered commands to each other, and then they set off down Bedford Terrace towards the Hotel Continental to look for Jews. The threat that the Nazis posed to Jews was of course real enough, but Anna's dream would appear to draw on a level of deep, a deeper level of irrational, unacknowledged vulnerability built up during the long years of emigration. By contrast, Charles Hannam's protagonist, Karl Hartland, a thinly disguised variation on Hannam's original surname, which was Hirschland, Karl Hartland endures six years as a young Jewish boy in the Third Reich, an experience that has a severe and lasting psychological impact on him. As a schoolboy in Essen, exposed to anti-Semitic propaganda, discriminatory treatment, insults, and physical threats on a daily basis, he comes to internalize Nazi racial ideology and to develop a profound inferiority complex. As Hannam puts it, since the beginning of the Nazi persecution, Karl had learned to hate the Jewish part of himself. The hatred the Nazis had directed at Jews had become part of Karl's inner feelings about himself. Why, after all, had he been thrown out of the country where his family had been settled for many generations unless he or other Jews had done something to deserve their fate? He'd come to believe that if only he had not been a Jew, all would have been well. And what seemed to him so unfair was that he, after all, was not one of those typical Jews the Nazi, Nazis caricatured in their party papers. Was his hair not fair and straight, his eyes blue, and his nose uncrooked? So his sense of self-hate and injustice was turned against other Jews. Some of the less admirable qualities displayed by the young Hartland are arguably accentuated by an underlying self-hatred that corrodes his standards of behavior, as well as his core of self-worth and stable identity. In Britain, he comes as a kinder transportee, uh, the headmaster of a school in Sussex takes Carl on as a boarder. But although the school imbues him with a deep admiration for the values of democracy, tolerance, fairness, and open-mindedness, he comes to see these new values as British. Desperate to remodel himself as British, he seeks to distance himself definitively from his German Jewish past. This provokes an acute identity crisis, further intensified by the wartime confrontation between Britain and Germany. Quote, he wished more than anything that he need not be a foreigner any longer. He wanted to disguise himself with a perfect Oxford accent, a pipe, and a commission in His Majesty's forces, a lovely uniform, and perhaps the spread wings of a pilot on his chest. That the British seem incapable of understanding the difference between Nazis and German Jewish refugees compounds the difficulty of his position. He learns when asked, asked where he comes from to reply that he's grown up in Sussex, presenting an acceptably British exterior to a world that he fears will not tolerate his German Jewish self. This leads on to a further complex of highly fraught identity problems for Karl. His desire to recreate himself as an Englishman causes him to reject the community of German Jewish refugees. Quote, among them, he felt a stranger. He detested their bad English. Their mixture of German, Yiddish, and English words seemed to him alien. They talked with their hands and they wore continental clothes. Karl wanted to be like his teachers and friends at school 
whom he admired, whose manners and attitudes he was learning to respect and adopt. Most of all, he wanted to be accepted. And if the price was the rejection of the people to whom he had once belonged, it seemed well worth paying at the time. Yet, he cannot help being drawn to the refugees and their social culture. He enjoys their humor, their mixing of languages, and their, uh, their ability to display their feelings. Karl is trapped between two sets of conflicting identities, German and British, and torn between two sets of cultures, English and German Jewish. Combined with the undermining of his self-confidence by his exposure to Nazi anti-Semitism, these inner conflicts arguably account for his inability to cope with the anti-Semitism that he encounters in Britain. His capacity to assert himself paralyzed by inner conflicts, he remains silent, unable to declare that he is himself Jewish. He had, Hannam writes, felt such disgust, hate, and fear when he found out about the Holocaust that he couldn't bear to talk about it, wanting only to forget about his German Jewish past and to be accepted into the English present. Quote, allow me to blot out the pain and in return, I will try to be a good Englishman. This trauma and the conflicts inflicted on him by forced emigration could not be resolved at the time. Only many years later was it possible to accept all as aspect. This is a quotation, sorry. Um, it, it's a closing quotation. Only many years later was it possible to accept all aspects of my personality, the Jewish, the refugee, and the English part. It took much time before I could say, look, I am what I am, not what you want me to be. Laura Siegel, ne Grossman, arrived in Britain on a kinder transport in December 1938, aged 10, followed later by her parents, cultured middle-class Viennese Jews who were, were reduced to working as domestic servants in Britain. In her memoir of the 10 years that she spent in Britain, Other People's Houses, Siegel describes with the pitiless accuracy of the child's eye, the humiliation inflicted on her parents by her British employers. In this text, the trauma experienced by a child torn from a secure, loving family and thrust into a strange and incomprehensible new world is conveyed by Siegel's skillfully crafted narrative, into the fabric of which the traumatic impact of forced emigration is, as it were, woven. Laura's alienation from her surroundings in Britain is expressed through her alienation from herself as she observes herself and her experiences as it were from outside, a deeply unsettling narrative mode that sets her inner world of feelings and observations at odds with the world around her. In this example from her early days at Dover Court Camp Harwich, where kinder transport children were accommodated, Laura's mind seems almost to operate independently, retreating into a world of the imagination and cutting her off from her feelings about her parents back in Vienna. Quote, my head kept nagging me to go and write another sponsor letter. It might be this letter I might be writing this instant that would save my parents. The lights came on in the hall, but still I sat. I tried to frighten myself into activity by imagining that the Nazis had come to the flat to arrest my father, but I didn't believe it. I tried to imagine my father and mother put into carts, but found I did not really care. Alarmed, I tried imagining my mother taken away and dead. I imagined myself dead and buried in the ground, but still I couldn't care anything about it. Absorbed in her own mental turmoil, she only registers immediate physical sensations. Trapped in a mental world of her own, she cannot participate in the activities arranged by the camp authorities for the children. Quote, a lady in a fur coat spoke to me. She said, 
would you like to come and dance with the other children? I said, no, because it did not seem possible that I could get up out of my coat. Come along, the lady said, come and dance. I said, I don't know how. Looking straight before me into the black of her dress where her fur coat flapped open. I thought, if she asks me a third time, I will go. The lady said, you can learn, but it still seemed to me she had not asked me in such a way that I could get up and go. And I waited for her to ask me the right way. The lady turned and walked off. I sat all afternoon waiting for her to come back. The disconnect here between Laura's thoughts and what is going on around her reflects her traumatic sense of separation from a beloved family home and her disorientation amidst new and unfamiliar surroundings. Eva Feige's memoir, Little Eden, A Child at War, is particularly rich in the resurfacing of forgotten memories. Indeed, the entire text stems from the return of memory occasioned in the late 1960s, when Fijis found herself traveling along a familiar stretch of road outside Sirencester, Gloucestershire, where she'd been evacuated as a child during the war, some three decades earlier. This gives rise to a flood of memories from her wartime childhood. Compared to London during the Blitz, Sirencester is indeed akin to a small paradise for her. But as with the original Garden of Eden, there then follows the inevitable expulsion from a haven of childhood innocence. The principal trauma that gradually reveals itself in the text is the child Eva's growing awareness of the Holocaust, in particular, the deportation and death of her grandparents who had remained behind in Berlin. This is represented as a traumatic loss of innocence through the acquisition of knowledge. At first, Eva remembers her grandparents only as tiny forlorn figures last glimpsed through the window of the plane taking her, her parents and brother from Berlin to England. Gradually, she becomes aware that the separation has become permanent. Then, she is made brutally aware of her identity as a Jew when her school friend Isolde shocks her by telling her that she's a Jew and doesn't believe in God. She's never heard the word Jew before. As she grows older, she begins to sense the connotations that attach to Jewishness in the Nazi years. Quote, the identity that Isolde had planted on me so bewilderingly one night in the dormitory that strange word, Jewish, was to acquire less mystery and a terrible reality. Unnamed tensions attached themselves to this state of being, of things unsaid, hinted at, a dark horror at the heart of the family, which could not be spoken about, but brooded over the dinner table. I still did not know just how much was involved with the words that I did hear. I knew that my grandparents had been deported, but I did not know all that the word implied, and it was not something one could ask questions about at home. When Eva's mother blurts out the truth about her deportation of her grandparents during one of their many rows, Eva is overwhelmed by a sense of guilt at her own behavior. I sat by myself in shame and misery thinking, why hadn't she told me? I told myself it was unfair, how was I supposed to know? And at the same time, I felt it was all my fault. Her unhappiness, my unreasonableness, even the death of those I loved. From now on, there was no escape from the burden of guilt. Eva experiences fully the traumatic knowledge of the Holocaust when she sees a newsreel from Bergen-Belsen in spring 1945. The horrors revealed in the cinema banish her forever from the paradise of childhood. Quote, at last I knew what it meant to be a Jew, the shameful secret which had been hinted at but kept from me for so many years, the mark on my head which I did not recognize, but which Isolde had known about four years before in the dormitory when I was a small child, innocent as Eve in the Garden of Eden, 
and as ignorant. The traumatic impact of the Holocaust finds expression in a recurring dream that accompanies Eva Feige's into adult life. She dreams of the moment of her departure from Berlin of, quote, a row of abandoned loved ones standing outside the airport building, waving wistfully at survivors whom they could no longer see. She and her parents are now survivors from whom the murdered grandparents are separated forever, but who remain a ghostly presence that comes to life in dreams in which the murdered grandparents can still sense the survivors across the great gulf of the Holocaust. <clears throat> Many years later, the trauma surfaces when Phyges tries to describe the dream to her psychoanalyst, only to find herself weeping, quote, uncontrollably and beyond words. Hopefully that has helped to, at least in part, resolve the trauma. In these four texts, chosen according to criteria unrelated to trauma, one can readily detect several categories of traumatic childhood experience. There is the trauma of flight, as in Judith Kerr's trilogy, where fear of the Nazis continues to haunt the young protagonist in exile in Britain. There's the trauma of persecution, as in Charles Hannam's trilogy, where Nazi discrimination and humiliation undermine the boy Carl's sense of self-worth and coherent identity. There's the trauma of forced emigration to an unfamiliar and uncaring environment, as in Laura Siegel's Other People's Houses. And there is the trauma of loss, as in Eva Feige's half-repressed memories of her, of her murdered grandparents. These texts also reveal the traumatic conflict of apparently incompatible identities that affected many refugee children who escaped from the Third Reich and struggled to find a settled foundation for a new life in Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, Tony. And if anybody wants to start typing in their thoughts, comments, questions in relation to what Tony has been saying, please, please do so. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Brinson and let me start by introducing her also quite briefly. Again, I suspect she's a familiar figure to many of you in this area of uh, cultural and uh, intellectual sort of study. Um, she's Emeritus Professor in German at Imperial College, London, a founder member like Tony of the Research Center for, for German and Austrian Exile Studies. She's published again far too many to, to list uh, very, very extensive, extensively in this area on subjects ranging very widely from the Austrian Centre and the Free German League of Culture to internment and indeed postal history. Uh, her particular research interests are on political exile and also the experience of women in exile. I will mention just very briefly two relevant publications, one uh, with her colleague Richard Dove called A Matter of Intelligence, M MI5, and the Surveillance of Anti-Nazi Refugees, uh, published in 2014. And very recently, and she recently gave a wonderful talk on this topic as part of the Insiders Outsiders online program, a book called, again with Richard Dove, Working for the War Effort, German-speaking refugees in British propaganda during the Second World War. Valentine Mitchell, 2021. Over to you, Charmian. Thank you, Monica. There were in pre-war and wartime London, numerous young German and Austrian refugees from Hitler who'd arrived in London without other family members. Alone, usually for the first time in their lives, they found themselves adrift isolated and homesick in an unfamiliar environment. While the majority were Jewish, a minority had taken refuge in Britain for political reasons. And of course, these two categories were by no means mutually exclusive. Some of them had arrived on the kinder transport. Others had escaped via Czechoslovakia with the help of the British Committee for, Ref for Refugees from Czechoslovakia. Others again, mostly young girls, had sought positions as domestics in British families, for which they were frequently quite unsuited, 
as a means of gaining entry to Britain. Among the organisations that aim to support these young people, two of the most significant were Young Austria and Free German Youth, and these are the subject of the paper I'm presenting today. Initially, the impetus to establish youth groups came from the young refugees themselves, though it would not be long before they came under the umbrella of the two best known of the adult refugee organisations in Britain, the Austrian Centre and the Free German League of Culture. And it was steadily politicised, as well as will be discussed below, to bring together young anti-Nazis, but on a non-party political basis. Young Austria, which started as a small group in Golders Green, expanded its membership between 1939 and 1943 from 20 to 1300, organised in 18 separate groups that were spread throughout Britain. Free German Youth, for its part, was a successor to an eponymous group founded in Czechoslovakia by young German exiles who were then forced by the German occupation of Czechoslovakia to leave for Britain. Between 20 and 30 young people, including some of the former group from Czechoslovakia, attended the Free German Youth Founding Conference in Kennington at its, as in Kennington. At its height in 1943, Free German Youth could boast a membership of 600 again with branches throughout Britain. Young Austria and Free German Youth were not intended for younger children, who were still subject to adult supervision of one kind or another, that a parent, foster parent or guardian, and were in full-time education, but rather for those who were around 14 years old and upwards. Aiming to offer the parental guidance the young people would normally have received as they embarked on adult life, the leading members or functionaries of the youth groups saw their role as standing in loco parentis, in place of the parent. In fact, membership extended until the age of 25 or thereabouts, and in the case of the functionaries, sometimes for longer. In the early days, the overriding aims of both youth organisations was to provide support and a familiar nurturing environment for their young members. This was to be brought about firstly through the setting up of regular Heimabende or club evenings at which members would be introduced to one another, would exchange experiences, sing familiar songs and play games. In other words, find themselves as individuals but within a collective identity. Apart from this, another important means of connecting the young people was through the regular newspapers that each group produced on behalf of its membership. In October 1939, for example, a young man, an Austrian by the name of Rudel, told fellow members in the group paper Jungs Österreich of how he'd been walking listlessly through Hyde Park when he'd suddenly encountered two friends from Vienna. Uh, next slide, please. After a friendly greeting and the usual questions, they tell me they're on the way to the club. Club, Friday, something begins to stir in me. Memories come flooding back. And I ask them again, Club, have I heard correctly? Yes, they both say. We've got singing and dancing today. And in an instant, they link arms with me and take me along with them. And now in the club, the same noise as prior to our club evenings back home. Cheerful faces, young boys and girls, acquaintances, friends from my group. And soon I find myself in the midst of things. My bad mood has evaporated, and I too am young and happy again. This was only one aspect of the youth group's mission, however, if initially the most pressing. Another all-important aim was to unite the young people in the fight against Nazism and to educate their members accordingly. Both Free German Youth and Young Austria aspired to restore their respective homelands to democratic nations after the war. Both groups expressed a special interest in fostering friendship and solidarity with the youth of all nations, including with the youth of Britain. But achieving unity under wartime conditions was not easy. After the outbreak of war, Germans and Austrians in Britain were officially designated enemy aliens. And by mid-1940, many of those over the age of 16, largely though not exclusively male, had been interned on the Isle of Man or elsewhere in Britain, or had even been deported to Canada or Australia. The internees included numerous members of Young Austria and Free German Youth, 
Consequently, another important role of the organizations was to support the internees as best they could by writing letters, collecting money, or by sending newspapers or food parcels into the camp. During this difficult time, both youth organizations, Austrian and German, continued to attract new members, including some from within the internment camps, to whom they represented a lifeline, and both expanded their provision accordingly. Education and training were on offer, for example, for those young people whose education had been interrupted by emigration. A wide range of talks and events and cultural activities were offered, many of them being intended to inculcate a pronounced national awareness, as will be seen. Physical activity in the form of sports, rambling, hiking, and camping, next slide please, were also of great importance. This was in part a legacy of the former German youth, uh, the next slide please, former German youth movement, which had influenced many of the young exiles before immigration. Okay. The, already, the steady expansion, that's it, that's, that's the camping. The steady expansion in activities and in organization can be seen from the group newspapers and programs of the war years. From a free German youth program for London, to take one example, from March 1944. For a start, in addition to the central club address in Hampstead, uh, slide please, 12 Belside Park, Hampstead, Northwest 3, other local North London branches have been established in the meantime in Wilsdon, Islington and Paddington, each with a wide range of events of its own. I don't imagine incidentally that the palm trees were there in 1940. Uh, some events were in English, others in German, a knowledge of English being an essential tool for the young exiles to survive in British society, while continued use of their mother tongue would be vital in the event of returning home. There were lectures on subjects of great relevance to the rebuilding of a democratic Germany, in which it was hoped that the young people would later participate, such as the tasks of trade unions or the English parliamentary system. Present and future employment prospects were served by a course on tailoring or another on general technical topics such as radio, automobiles, and, and coal. Political education was another important topic, in the form of a regular socialist work group, for instance, or of particular relevance to target audience, a fortnightly study circle on refugee youth and the solution of the Jewish problem. In addition to the continuation of the regular club evenings, cultural activities such as dancing, film, literature, drama, and music all played an important role in club life. The young Austrians likewise offered their members a rich diet of activities, including training in trades important to war efforts, such as welding, and numerous historical and political talks. Cultural activities were favoured, were favored, which carried a particularly Austrian flavour. Austrian literature and theatre, for example, whereby young Austria could differentiate itself from free German youth as well as distance itself from the Anschluss, the Nazi annexation of Austria in March 1938. Such activities were seen as youthful propaganda, both internally to its own refugee membership and externally to the British host population, going right back to some early displays of Austrian folk dancing that young Austria had offered to delighted spectators in Hyde Park back in 1939. It was here in the presentation and representation of the Heimat to the Austrian and German youth organizations, so similar in many ways, deviated fundamentally one from another. The young Germans, anxious to present positive aspects of the Heimat amidst the many obvious negative ones, had to look there much harder for areas of their culture and history of which to be proud. The German cultural heritage, certainly, their revolutionary history, the efforts of the German resistance, for some of them also suffered from carrying the burden of inherited German shame and guilt around with them, from which the young Austrians were seemingly able to free themselves. Even though many of the young Austrians had themselves experienced the Anschluss and the enthusiastic reception the invading Nazis had received from the Austrian population, they endeavored in exile to portray Austria as a victim rather than a collaborator of the Nazis. 
The Austrians, and in this, and in, as in other ways, young Austria very much took its lead from the parent organization, the Austrian Center, could make especially powerful national propaganda to Austrian music. The exiled Austrians laid claim to classical composers of international repute, such as Haydn, Mozart, and Schubert, though perhaps less justifiably to Beethoven and Brahms, both born in Germany, whom they, the Austrians, could conveniently describe as Wahlösterreicher, Austrians by choice. And it was also in the field of music that the young Austrians succeeded in making a lasting name for itself with the British public. Um, next slide, please. The Choir of Young Austria, conducted by Erwin Weiss. Um, according to the Austrian exile scholar Wolfgang Muchic, one of the most successful instruments of exile propaganda. It made its debut in, in the Wigmore Hall in May 1942, and also received a rapturous reception, uh, but also created a great demand for its services thereafter. It's interesting to note that after the war, back in Vienna, Weiss rose to great eminence in musical circles, becoming the director of the Vienna Conservatory. There should also be recorded that the leader of the less well-known Free German Youth Choir in Britain, the talented musician Andre Azrael, likewise well, rose to musical prominence in the German Democratic Republic after the war. That the Austrian Youth Choir made a greater impression, however, on the host nation, Britain, points, among other things, to the advantage they had in Britain over the Germans in terms of national propaganda. Yet, although perhaps from a more difficult starting point, free German youth was not to be defeated in terms of propaganda to their British hosts. In July 1942, they played a major role in collaboration with the Free German League of Culture, the anti-Nazi exhibition. And yes. next slide, please. Allies inside Germany displayed an empty shop in Regent Street. The exhibition, which set out to demonstrate the existence of anti-Nazi resistance inside Germany, consisted of illegal publications, pamphlets, photographs and the like, and attracted no fewer than 30,000 visitors as well as interest in the British press. Among other things, members of Free German Youth took turns in manning the exhibition. One of them, Ursula Herzberg, recalled years later that so great was, great was her commitment to the task that even on the day of their wedding, she and her husband-to-be had taken no more than a few hours off from their exhibition duties. Meanwhile, from June 1941, significant changes were taking place within both youth organizations. Up until then, the pastoral, semi-parental aspect of their work with the young people in their charge seemed to have taken pre precedence. From that date on, as I've already mentioned, the youth groups, despite their non-party political origins, were becoming increasingly politicized. In this, they were once again taking their lead from the Austrian Center and the Free German League of Culture, which, although communists led from early on, but remained covertly so until Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. With Russia entering the war on the side of the Allies, though, communism as anti-fascism became more politically acceptable to the British in general, as well as the dominant political persuasion within young Austria and free German youth. Other refugee organizations, especially social democratic ones, which may previously have displayed mild hostility towards these groups, were now fiercely opposed to them, forbidding their membership to take part in events put on by young Austria or free German youth. One of the casualties of this policy was a brilliant musician and inspirational choir master, Evin Weiss, who, although a social democrat, had conducted the young Austria choir into a position of national prominence but eventually, reluctantly, had to resign from this. Within the youth organizations and encouraged by leading members of the, of the senior organizations, the functionaries in particular tended increasingly to embrace communism. Joining the Communist Jugendverband, the Communist Youth Group, um, in addition to war work in the factories, they were expected to devote themselves to party work, all with youthful idealism. And the casualties, from the, the increasingly politicization were not confined to Erwin Weiss. Another was the young uh, poet Erich Fried. Could I have the next slide, please? 
uh, Erich Peters sitting in the middle of the three sitting down, uh, who, although a committed member of both Young Austria and the Communist Jugendverband, suffered badly from the lack of time to devote to his writing. In November 1943, he addressed a letter to the Young Austria chairman, Fritz Walter. Next slide, please. Firstly, factory work, mostly years of it, often long hours. Secondly, work in an organization, in our organization, and as a person. If one is a functionary, then there is in any case very little time left over. And at least amongst the people I know, no one can say, ah, now I have two hours free. Now I shall create a work of art. Indeed, shortly after this, Fried resigned from the Communist Youth Group. An important contributory cause here was the suicide on the 12th of October 1943 of his friend and fellow poet, Hans Schmeier, who, suffering from Fried from expectations he felt he could not meet, threw himself off the roof of his London accommodation. The extent to which party political concerns had come to outweigh pastoral care within the development of free German youth in young Austria is clearly illustrated here. Yet it should also be noted that some of their ex-members have since claimed to have been unaware of any political pressures within the organisations. There is a paradox in the fact that while politically the two youth organisations, German and Austrian, evolved among, among almost identical lines, culturally, the Austrians at least, were intent on stressing the differences with an explicitly Austrian repertoire. The version of the Anschluss was put about by the Austrian Centre and subsidiary organisations like Young Austria, that Germany had aggressively invaded and occupied Austria, was strengthened greatly by the Moscow Declaration of the Allies of late 1943, confirming Austria's status as Hitler's first victim. While the declaration was a purely strategic move by the Allies in order to drive a wedge between the two enemy countries, for the Austrian exiles, it represented the fulfillment of their chief aim of an independent Austria after the war. As hostilities drew to an end, young Austria and free German youth, together with the senior organisations, set out to train members for the return home under what would very likely be appalling conditions. The policy of both youth groups, which was also the Communist Party line, was that members should return home after the war to play their part in the physical, economic, political and moral reconstruction of their respective countries. Courses were set up in first aid, hygiene, childcare and the like, skills that would be of obvious use. The fact that the Austrians gave the title Jugendführer Schule, uh, slide please, uh, to their programme of courses was probably unfortunate, but in no way appears to have affected the commitment shown by the young students. Yet this policy of participating in reconstruction was particularly difficult for the young Jewish members, for many of whom their idea of returning to Germany or, or Austria was utterly repugnant. In the end, it's been calculated that out of 600 members of free German youth, 200 follow the party line and return to Germany, 200 remain in Britain, and 200 emigrated onwards for instance, the United States or to Palestine. Exact numbers of returning young Austrians, however, are not known, although the proportions are, are unlikely to have been dissimilar. However, returning home to a desperately war-torn country and a deeply demoralized population was an arduous experience, especially for a young person with very little to return to. Doubtless, when the older functionaries in both organisations pressurised their younger members into returning home, this was less with the welfare of the young individual in mind, thus running contrary to the youth group's original aims, and more with the dictates of the party. The young Austria chairman himself, Fritz Walter, having reverted to his original name of Otto Brikacek, later acknowledged the difficulties returning young Austrians had faced from anti-Semitism and anti-emigre prejudice. Sometimes, he recalled, it was really heartbreaking to see how scandalously people behaved towards the emigres. End of quotation. He even questioned the rightness of the policy of persuading the Austrians to return, conceding, I quote, 
we were probably too optimistic in what we told them. Returnees from free German youth faced a rather different, different set of circumstances from those experienced by their young Austrian counterparts, since most of those who were committed communists chose to return to the Soviet zone of Germany, the later German Democratic Republic. Here too, though, the young idealists were met with anti-Semitism and with suspicion directed against those returning from emigration in the West rather than from the Soviet Union. A collective volume of memoirs compiled by former Free German Youth members could not be published until 1996. That is, until after the fall of the German Democratic Republic. Since prior to that, a book on anti-fascist activity in the West would have been politically unacceptable. While a certain disappointment is discernible in the memoirs, the now elderly ex-Free German Youth members are united in their appreciation of what their wartime organisation would offer them in terms of social and educational activities. And in particular, they recall the role that it played in their young lives as a parental or familial substitute. Take the words of Alfred Fleischhacker, for example. Slide, please. After all, most of us had arrived in Britain without parents or relations. For everyone, including myself, free German youth offered us a kind of substitute for parents and siblings, it was our family. Thank you very much.